Good evening, it is Monday again, and we are going to continue reading The Family Under the Bridge by Natalie Savage Carlson. Um, we are already on chapter eight, so we're going to be really close to finishing. I think tomorrow is the conclusion. So, all right, now, the end of chapter seven, it was Christmas Eve, and they returned back to the gypsy village, and after having gone to the Christmas Eve party, right? And they exchanged gifts with the, gift, with the gypsies, Chapter 8 begins. Old Armand found that he enjoyed the companionship of the gypsy camp. He liked to sit with his back against the fence watching Susie teach the gypsy girls and Paul play games with the boys. On the other hand, Susie was not satisfied. She often frowned as she watched Paul and the boys. At last she brought her problem to the hobo. I'm worried about my brother, she confided in a grown-up way. He doesn't act like he belonged to our family anymore. He's always playing with the gypsies and he hardly ever comes near Evelyn and me. We are his family. Armand had noticed this himself, but he tried to comfort Susie. Paul is a boy, he said. So naturally he doesn't want to hang around girls all the time. You wouldn't want to put him in skirts, would you? But Susie only pointed wrathfully across the courtyard. Look, he cried, he even stands like a gypsy because Paul was idly standing on one leg with the other drawn up under him. He looked like a small stork. People have different ways of resting, Armand assured her. Now me, I lie down. That's the best way yet. Paul didn't help matters. I wish I were a gypsy, he told them one day. I like the way they live. I wish I could go away with them in the spring. Armand tried to reason with him. If God wanted you to be a gypsy, he would have made you one, he said. But he doesn't want everybody traipsing all around the country and living in tents. You don't want to spend your grown-up life banging on tin pans, do you? Now, when you have a smart sister like Susie to teach you things. Paul scowled and dug his toe in the sand. Armand smiled to see that his worn shoes were neatly, were neatly capped with shining copper. Paul followed the, his look and he smiled too. The boys helped me mend my shoes, he explained. Then he ran away to join them. You see, said Susie, he's even learning how to work with copper. Armand tried to think of something else to say to her, but his mouth lay, but his mouth only gaped open and his tongue stiffened. <laughs> a policeman was entering the yard. He was a stern looking officer with heavy coat and full cut cape. His hat was pulled down over his thick eyebrows. The gypsy boys, followed by Paul, disappeared into the tents. Most of the men were gone, but the few remaining ones vanished as quickly as the boys. Even the dogs, Jojo among them, tucked their tails between their legs and dived under one automobile left in the yard. Morelli rose from the steps of the van and went to meet the policeman. Your fortune, monsieur? she asked in her softest voice. Let me tell you your, your fortune. Perhaps there is a promotion waiting for you. The policeman ignored her offer. Is there a Nicky here? he asked gruffly. No, said Morelli, he has gone. Where? asked the policeman. Morelli shrugged her shoulders. He's out of town. When will he return, persisted the man. Tomorrow? Who knows, said Morelli vaguely. Today is today. Tomorrow may come late this year. The policeman turned on his heel and stamped away. Immediately, the gypsy faces appeared in every tent opening. The dogs came slinking from under the car and the women gathered around Morelli. The men and children quickly joined them. They want to arrest Nicky, assumed or guessed one of the men. Hmm. It must be because he cut down the Christmas tree, said Paul. They want to put him in the army, wailed the women. I know that's it. They put my Toredo, or Teodoro, in the army, and he was never the same again. Gave up the wandering life and settled down in a house. All the gypsies were upset. Without another word to each, uh, with, to each other, they began packing up their belongings and tearing down their tents. Petro grumbled when they started on his, but when he learned the reason, he awakened as if a pitcher of ice water had been thrown in his face. We can't leave until the rest of the men come home from the restaurants, said Morelli. She went to the opening and peered down the street. The Calcet children watched the activity with growing alarm. They'd never seen the gypsies work so hard or so fast. You are going to leave, cried Susie. We always leave if the police visit us, said Tinka. If we didn't, someone might be put in jail. Morelli appealed to Armand. Why don't you come with us? She invited you and the Calcets. The skies are blue in Provence now and the and the flowers are blooming. I'll go with you, cried Paul with shining eyes. I want to be a gypsy. Hmm, here's a picture of them packing up their tents and 
all of their belongings. No, no, cried Susie, grabbing his arm. We can't go off with the gypsies. We have to stay with Mama. We're her children. Paul tore loose from her grasp. I'm sick of being wet and cold, he said. If I was a big man, I'd go to work and make enough money to buy us a house. Susie grabbed him again and angrily shook him. You're always bragging about what you'd do if you were a big man, she retorted. You better begin thinking about what you should do while you're a little boy. I'm going with the gypsies, repeated Paul, trying to pull away. Oh, Monsieur Armand, implored Susie. Please don't let him go. Armand gently put his hand on Paul's shoulder. You can't go with them, boy, he said. You've got to stay here with your family. Why can't I go? asked Paul rebelliously. Why do I have to stay here? Armand crossed his arms and stared down at the red-headed boy. You can't go because, because, because you've got red hair, he said. That's why. Why does that matter? asked Paul. It matters plenty, answered Armand. How far do you think the gypsies would get with a red-headed child? People would think they'd kidnapped you. The police would put you in a strange home and, in gyp and the gypsies in jail. A sudden thought darkened Susie's blue eyes. We won't have any place to stay now, she said. Do you think the new house will be ready for us in time, Monsieur Armand? Armand lowered his head in shame. If we could move there soon, said Paul, I wouldn't want to go with the gypsies. I'd stay and help us move in. Will you take us to look at it? Susie begged the hobo. Then we can see if it's almost finished. Armand put his head between his hands. There won't be any new house for you, he confessed. It was all a mistake. Turned out the builders didn't want children and dogs in it. And you know how it is with a brand new place. They want to keep it looking that way. No house for us, cried Susie with a catch in her voice. Nothing? Armand couldn't look in her eyes. Paul darted away to the gypsies. When the rest of the men returned, they were startled to hear about the policeman's unexpected visit. Nikki was upset by more than this, more than the call. Just at this unfortunate time when I've lost my wallet with all my week's earnings in it, he cried. I know I lost it in the cafe of the Laughing Frog. The owner said he would have it returned to me if it were found. Hmm, <laughs> grunted Armand. Who would return a wallet full of money? Some people collect the stuff. Petro cried, tried to help. We can use what I have in my pocket, he offered. Then we will have to work along the way. I'm really wide awake now. <laughs> the little house on wheels was hooked to the back of one of the automobiles. The gypsies and their dogs piled over the seats. <clears throat> Jojo whined to go too because he'd enjoyed his ride so much on Christmas Eve. We left one of the tents for you all, cried Nikki. There's almost another week due on us. There's almost another week due us on the yard, Morelli added. We've been paying rent to the wreckers. Uh, so they wouldn't have to pay for rent for about a week. The automobiles coughed and sputtered. Then they slowly ground through the sand toward the opening. The gypsies waved goodbye. Tinka threw Susie a kiss. Jojo tried to follow the cars, but Armand called him back. The little house on wheels, which had been a home for Susie and her mother and sister, disappeared into the street. There was nothing left to show that gypsies had ever lived in this yard. Nothing but a weather-beaten tent and the dead ashes of their fires. Then those left behind noticed something else missing from the yard. There was no Paul. He was gone. He left with them, wailed Susie. Paul went off with the gypsies. Evelyn began to howl. Well, I want Paul, she, yet, she wept. I want my brother. Oh, la la, groaned their mind. And there is still Madame to face. He silently set to work, getting a cold lunch for the children. The gypsies had left some cheese and bread in the tent, but nobody seemed hungry, not even Jojo. Armand felt that he was to blame for it all. He sat down with his back against the fence and thought and thought. Oh, oh, it was all his fault. He had brought the children to the gypsies in the first place, but he had only tried to help them. That's what he got for ever having to do with starlings. Now he was caught in the same net with them. But was he? No, he could always get up and go. He could push his buggy right through that opening in the fence and never come back. At the thought, he rose to his feet and looked toward the opening. To his amazement, he saw a forlorn little figure come through it. Paul, he shouted, is it really you, Paul? The boy nodded sadly, as if he wished that it were somebody else. You left the gypsies and came back to us because we're your family, cried Susie joyously. I didn't go away with the gypsies, said the boy. You're always saying I should stop bragging about what I will do 
when I'm big and do something now. So I went down to the halls and tried to get a job. You tried to get a job at the halls? Asked Armand with fresh surprise. That funny tramp you knew said they needed pushers, Paul reminded him. You're too little to work, said Susie. You have to be big like Monsieur Armand. The hobo uneasily tugged at his whiskers. Paul looked up at the, at the copper toes on his shoes. That's what all the men said, he continued. They laughed at me. They showed me a big cart full of boxes and told me that if I could push it, I could have a job. Paul wiped his eyes with his knuckles. I pushed and I pushed, but I couldn't even budge it. Then they all laughed at me again. Armand was indignant. The nerve of them, he exclaimed. I'll go down there tomorrow morning and hang them all up on the hooks. I'll, but he didn't finish his threats. He was frightened to see the policeman coming in again. Oh, oh, this must have something to do with Paul's visit to the halls. Perhaps they had got wind of these vagabond children and the policeman was coming to take them away. Oh, oh, they should have gone with the gypsies. But the policeman looked bewildered. Weren't the gypsies in this yard, he asked. They had to leave suddenly, said Armand, received word of a sick relative in Normandy. And I suppose the one named Nicky left with them, added the policeman. Of course, said Armand, he, it was his relative who was sick. The policeman pursed his lips and shook his head. Too bad, he said, a wallet lost by him was found under the table at the cafe of the Laughing Frog. Too bad. He pulled a new leather wallet from a pocket in his cape. And it is the and in it is the lucky ticket that won yesterday's lottery. Too bad, it is a shame. Armand's eyes brightened. I'll keep the wallet for him, he offered. The policeman eyed him suspiciously. His sharp eyes saw Armand's unkempt whiskers and ragged tramp clothes. He tucked the wallet under his cape again. I can't deliver it to anyone but the rightful owner, he said. Then he turned and walked away. A lottery ticket that won? And his wallet with his money returned back? Oh my goodness. He turned and walked away, shaking his head and muttering, too bad, too bad. Armand exploded with a roar. Too bad indeed, he roared. I call it a tragedy to lose that nice new wallet. And all the money, said Susie. And the lucky ticket, added Paul. Poof, said Armand. What would Nicky do with so much money? It might ruin his character. But anybody would hate to lose that wallet. It's just the right size for carrying around the coins that the man needs. What will we do now, worried Susie? We won't have any place to live after this week. Mama will cry, said Evelyn solemnly. I wish I could have moved that cart, said Paul. I tried so hard. A great feeling of shame came over Armand at the, at the boy's words. The children's eyes were turned to him with that needful look. He cleared his throat. Everything is going to turn out all right, he assured them. I'm going to get a steady job. Your mama and I ought to make enough between us to rent that room in Clichy for you nestlings. Then, frightened by his own brave words, he slumped to the ground and leaned back weakly against the wall. Oh no. Well, that's the end of chapter eight. Can you imagine how this is going to end? <laughs> we'll have to find out tomorrow. You guys have a good night and we'll see you then.